Welcome to our webinar, everyone who is uh, joining in. We're going to start in about one minute. We'll let the participants come in from the waiting room. Uh, thanks for joining us. Again, we'll start in about one minute. All right. So in the interest of time, um, let's get started at six o'clock. We want to thank everyone for joining us today at our uh, latest conversation. Um, as many of you guys have known, we've been doing these COVID conversations for over two years now. We've done 15 webinars primarily focused on COVID and the COVID response and COVID vaccines through the California Immunization Coalition and the American Academy of Pediatrics in California. We've shifted a little bit and we are trying now to um, do these more about emerging infectious disease issues. We did one on monkeypox a few months ago, and today we're going to talk about um, RSV as this is the biggest of emerging issues right now in the pediatric world. So um, Cameron, can you go back a few slides? So uh, thank you guys for joining. Um, just to remind everyone a few housekeeping uh, that all of our lines are muted during this program. We do have a Q&A box. So the way this program will work is um, our guest, uh, Dr. Angela Campbell, will speak and then we will have a conversation afterwards and we will ask the questions that you have provided either before or during the talk. So please put them in the Q&A box. And then we will record this webinar. It'll be posted to our California Immunization Coalition website, as well as our YouTube page. Uh, Dr. Campbell works for the CDC and per regulations, we cannot provide the slides after the presentation. So, um, so we will not post the slides, but we will post resources that she mentions and we also also will post a copy and a, a recording of this webinar itself uh, so you can watch it again or send it to your colleagues. Next. So um, again, thank you again. This is always sponsored by California Immunization Coalition and the American Academy of Pediatrics in California. Next. And um, I am one of your co-hosts, um, Eric Ball. I'm a primary care pediatrician at the Chalk Primary Care Network. And I'm on the board of the California Immunization Coalition. And I'm always joined by my colleague, Dr. Pia Panaraj, who is um, an infectious disease physician at Children's Hospital Los Angeles. She's the vice president of the California Immunization Coalition and co-chair with me of our Emerging Issues Committee. And with that, I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Panaraj to introduce our speaker, Dr. Angela Campbell. Great. We are very thankful um, that Dr. Angela Campbell agreed to give the talk today. Um, she is a medical officer at the CDC and um, lead of the Severe Illness and Multi-System Inflammatory Syndrome Unit of the Epidemiology Branch, uh, COVID and Other Respiratory Viruses Division um, at the National Center for Immunization and Respiratory Diseases. She completed her medical degree at Vanderbilt University and then trained in pediatrics and pediatric infectious disease, diseases at Seattle um, in uh, Seattle Children's um, and worked there for a little bit before returning to the CDC. So um, thank you for, for your presentation today. Okay. I'm off mute, I believe, and I think I'm sharing. Is it good? Everything looks great. Perfect. Okay, great. Um, well, thank you and good evening. Um, I'm, I'm, I am really pleased to join you all tonight to discuss uh, respiratory syncytial virus. Um, it's actually a virus I've, I've worked on uh, my whole career. Um, I'm sort of circling back to it. I. Uh, I am a pediatric uh, infectious disease doctor, as uh, as was said, and I, I trained in Seattle and actually worked on RSV and other viruses after transplant for several years before going back to the CDC, where I had done um, uh, epidemic intelligence service uh, previously. And at the CDC, I was in the flu division for six years until the COVID pandemic. And so I guess that's a good combination because I am going to discuss just a little bit related to um, flu and COVID tonight as well, since uh, obviously everything is playing together right now. 
Um, so I'll, I'll start first by reviewing um, the burden of RSV in children, uh, and then I'll discuss seasonality in the US, uh, both what, what we've been used to in the past, and then what we're experiencing more recently, and then I'll end with uh, prospects for prevention. Let's just, okay, good, it's advancing. So we'll start by um, talking about burden. Um, I, I don't have, it, it is a little bit, uh, because this was a, um, not, not planned as much in advance as some talks, there are some slides I might have wanted to uh, include that I couldn't because they hadn't been cleared yet. So there are a few things I just want to mention along the way that I may not have slides for. I, I think that I am um, talking to a choir uh, here, and so I know that you all are, are very familiar with RSV. Um, but, uh, you know, typically even lower tract disease will start with upper respiratory tract symptoms. Uh, and then typically we see the lower tract symptoms develop on days two or three and peak on days four or five, and then gradually resolve over two or three weeks. Um, and I'm sure that most of you are quite familiar with RSV. Um, but I do just want to discuss uh, the, the burden a bit. So, it is the leading cause of hospitalization in U.S. infants. Uh, it can infect the small airways and the lungs, particularly in um, premature infants. Uh, most babies are infected in the first year of life and nearly all by age two. Uh, approximately 40% of infected infants will develop a lower respiratory tract infection, uh, typically bronchiolitis. Uh, and three to 5% of those babies will require hospitalization. Premature infants, those born particularly at less than 30 weeks gestation, have hospitalization rates three times higher than term infants. Preterm infants also have higher rates of ICU admission and mechanical ventilation than term infants. Uh, there are other factors that increase the risk of severe RSV disease. These include chronic lung disease of prematurity, uh, hemodynamically significant congenital heart disease, some immunodeficiency states. Uh, and children with neuromuscular disorders. But I think uh, really important to point out that even though prematurity and these other conditions do increase the risk for severe RSV-associated illness, RSV is also the leading cause of hospitalization in healthy term infants. Uh, and unfortunately, one of the risks for severe RSV disease is acquiring it for the first time at a very young age. So the hospital rates are highest between 30 and 60 days of life. Uh, and an estimated 79% of children hospitalized with RSV aged less than two actually have no underlying medical conditions. So in short, all young infants are at risk of severe RSV and about two to 3% of all infants will be hospitalized for RSV in the first year of life. And actually there was just a, a Lancet respiratory medicine paper that came out on the 10th of November that quantified exactly that. It was conducted in Europe, so in, in high income settings, and they estimated that RSV associated acute respiratory infection led to hospitalization in one of every 56 healthy term born infants. Oops, let's see, I think it went farther. There we go. Um, so this is our, our burden pyramid that we often look at for uh, many respiratory viruses. For RSV in the US, uh, in children less than five, it's associated with 100 to 300 deaths, this is annually, 58,000 to 80,000 hospitalizations, a half a million emergency department visits, and approximately 1.5 million outpatient visits. And although these vary by year, for the most part, these numbers are typically higher than what is seen for these outcomes with influenza in the young infants and children. And then I also want to note that globally, there was another paper that just came out and quantified the, these burdens uh, globally, and, and it's enormous. So it was a systematic review that looked at 481 studies, uh, and they estimated that in the year 2019, there were more than 100,000 RSV attributable deaths in children less than five years old, 3.6 million RSV associated acute lower respiratory tract, respiratory tract hospital admissions and 33 million um, associated uh, acute lower respiratory tract episodes that didn't necessarily receive hospitalization. So um, again, all the studies have really confirmed that the greatest burden is, is in children zero to six months of age. Okay. So CDC um, 
uh, generates RSV associated disease burden estimates in the US from this network called the New Vaccine Surveillance Network or NVSN. Uh, it conducts year round acute respiratory illness surveillance. Uh, it was originally at three sites from 2000 to 2009 and then expanded to seven sites uh, in 2016 un until now it didn't end at 2021. Um, but the data I'm gonna show you are from that period. Uh, these same seven sites also continue prospective surveillance in the inpatient ED and outpatient settings. So basically any child that is hospitalized and meets an ARI case definition, acute respiratory illness, is enrolled, respiratory samples are collected and they undergo multiplex PCR testing for uh, multiple viruses, including RSV. And then because these uh, hospitals are uh, they know their institution's catchment area and their market share. We're able to do population-based denominators to estimate disease burden um, with hospitalization rates per 100,000. So some of the next uh, figures I'm gonna show you are from this network. Uh, these are two surveillance periods, uh, 2000 to 2004 and 2016 to 2020. And uh, you know, consistently it's been demonstrated that the hospitaliz hospitalization rates are highest in children aged zero to five months and decrease with decrease with increasing age. Um, and really in this, in this figure, the um, earlier time period and the later time period are, uh, show pretty consistent estimates. Um, what I don't have on this figure is that they've now gone and looked at the rates for 2021 alone. And that was the year you remember after all the mitigation measures had been in place for COVID pandemic, and then RSV came, came back in, in its first surge. Um, and in that 2021 season, the RSV hospitalization rates were overall 32% higher than these 2016 to 2020 estimates. Uh, and again, highest in the, in the um, zero to five months and the six to 11 month age group. And this is again in the earlier time periods, um, looking at hospitalization rates in, in those children aged zero to 11 months by month. Uh, and you, you, know, you can really see the demonstration that the highest incidence is in the, those one and two month olds, and then it decreases as they get older. So because the incidence of severe disease is so high in these first months of life, really the first six months of life, that's what the prevention products are focusing on with um, maternal immunization to protect the baby, and aminoprophylaxis with monoclonal antibodies. And I am gonna talk about those things later in this, in this talk. So NBSN data have also been used to develop estimates of emergency department and outpatient clinic visits. And as with the hospitalization rates, the highest ED rates have typically been in the youngest infants. In that first surveillance period, the rates were nearly equal among the zero to five month and six to 11 month infants. And then in the second period, the highest rates of ED visits were in the infants age zero to five months. And the outpatient clinic rates were highest in those slightly older six to 11 month infants in both surveillance periods. So now moving to seasonality, which um, I'm, I'm really showing you what, what has been typical in the past. And then I'll show you um, uh, data from this recent surge that we're having uh, in both, in, in I will show you I'll show you the trends in the virus detections, hospitalizations, and ED visits. Okay, so this is the, the NERVE system, CDC's National Respiratory and Enteric Virus Surveillance System. It's the primary source for monitoring RSV seasonality in the US. It's a passive lab-based surveillance system that includes commercial hospital and public health labs, uh, about 300 labs all together routinely voluntarily report RSV results. And so we get weekly reporting of total tests performed and RSV positive tests to monitor real-time circulation. Um, the majority of the tests reported are PCR assays and the testing is primarily clinician directed and it does include people of all ages, um, including adults. And I would note that NERVS also does monitor circulation patterns of other viruses, including the um, human para-influenza viruses, metanumaviruses, the adenoviruses, the seasonal human coronaviruses, as well as rotavirus and norovirus. Um, and I will, I have provided a list of resources at the end, um, but now that I think about it, I'm not sure I included the links for nerves, so I'll, I'll include that in, in what you all can receive after the call. So this is, um, 
Uh, this, this figure shows normalized RSV detections by epidemi epidemiologic week um, from the years 2011 to 2020. And so that means that regardless of the raw data, it was converted to what it would have been if the peak of a given season was at 1,000, and then essentially all the data is rescaled to have a range between zero and 1,000. Uh, and the reason for this is to preserve the, so that you can see the timing of the onset and the peak and the offset of each season. Um, but it eliminates the variation in intensity and accounts for testing and lab reporting. And so the, the point of this is, um, I don't know if you guys can see my pointer, but um, basically right in the middle, the MMM, MMWR week one represents the first week of January. Uh, and so during this, this almost decade, really, RSV circulation was highly seasonal, uh, and there was always a predictable peak of activity between December and February typically starting earliest in, um, uh, in the South and particularly in Florida, and then, and then generally moving uh, in a wave across the country. But as, uh, as you all know, the COVID-19 pandemic interrupted seasonal circulation of RSV and of many other respiratory viruses. And so there was um, almost a year with very limited circulation, which is that blue line um, that shows the 2020 flat line and then um, going into 2021. And so we had our first like comeback of RSV in this intraseasonal wave shown that peaked in early August, 2021. And that peak continued through the fall into December. So really odd seasonality last year. Uh, and this slide was actually made for the June ACIP meeting this year. And so at that time, you can see on this slide that the, um, uh, we didn't know what was coming next, right? <laughs> Uh, and, and the yellow line represented what was happening in the summer of 2022, uh, and RSV circulation was sort of near its uh, baseline. But we know that didn't stay that way. So this um, figure is looking at uh, RSV test positivity, again, in the nerve system, um, and showing RSV percent positivity by HHS region. So each line is a color that corresponds to an HHS region of the country. Um, there is a data lag as we wait for labs to report. So it's, you have to be somewhat cautious interpreting what's happening at the most right end of the curve, um, but it still highlights generally the regional trends we're seeing. Uh, you can see all the lines have, starting to, have started to go up since September. Um, and much earlier than we would normally expect. Uh, and first, it was the regions three, four, and six, which are the red, green, and tan lines. And then most of the US is still seeing an increase in positivity, but we are actually starting to see decreases in region three, which is the mid-Atlantic, four, which is my home, uh, the Southeast, including Atlanta, six, which is um, called the Southwest, but you can really see this is all like South Central, including Texas. And then eight, the Rocky Mountain is starting to go down a little. But again, that's kind of hard to know if that's artifact because of reporting lag. All the other regions are still going up. Um, California lies in region nine, which is kind of that brown color, um, like the fifth line from the, well, it's right in the middle <laughs> of the, it's the fifth line down, the fifth line up. Uh, so California is continuing to increase. And these trends are consistent with what we're seeing with pediatric um, inpatient and ICU bed utilization, which has actually been increasing since July in most of the regions. And we're seeing an increase in ED visits for acute respiratory illness. So nationally right now, we're at about 78% pediatric inpatient occupancy and 81% PICU occupancy. And then I checked the HHS region nine, uh, those numbers are very similar, 79% inpatient occupancy and 80% PICU occupancy. Um, and, and some of that is made worse, I know, with, with staffing shortages. So occupancy is uh, somewhat relative to, to having staff to take care of the children. Um, these, uh, this, this is a fabulous resource called RSVNet. Um, it provides weekly population-based pediatric hospitalization rates. Um, and these data are, are preliminary and subject to change, but it's, it's really an amazing interactive website where you can go and look at um, rates by age, by race, ethnicity, by uh, HHS region. And so what you're seeing here is um, 
four prior seasons in the different colors down low. And then the 2022-2023 season in green at the top left of the graph. Uh, there's a little bit of noise, again, as it goes down, that might not be real. Um, that might just reflect data reporting lag. Um, but essentially, it's enough that you can see that the, the green line, the RSV-associated hospitalization rates, are at a five-year high for this time of year. And this is in children less than 18. Um, it, it really, the, the, the current rates have surpassed previous season peak rates that we would normally have seen in, in December and January. And at the end of the talk, I might, um, I might switch to my actual computer screen and show you this website and show what you can do with it to look at the different, um, uh, the different subgroups, because it, it is a nice way to see what's happening. Uh, this is another picture from RSVNet showing data by age, uh, and you can see that um, the, the kind of blue line on the top is the infants uh, less than six months old. Um, and then the next highest is the six to 12 months. So those are, again, the highest um, hospitalization rates in those young infants. But you can also see an increase in the one to two-year-olds and the two to four-year-olds. And then that red line at the bottom is pretty flat. That's the five to 17-year-olds. Um, and this is a different surveillance system. This is from uh, NSSP, the National Syndromic Surveillance Program, which looks at um, electronic encounter data from emergency departments and urgent cares. Uh, and the RSV definition pulls from the chief complaint text and from the diagnosis and looks for RSV or bronchiolitis or syncytial virus. And so this is specific to showing ED visits for RSV and RSV-like illness. And you can see, you know, most of the disease is occurring in infants less than one, as we would expect, but there's also quite an increase in older children with the RSV-associated ED visits, uh, even the two to four-year-olds in the blue and even the five to 11-year-olds in the red. And here's where I, I'm showing just a couple of other viruses, because I think it helps to put in context what's happening. Um, RSV is not the only game in town right now. Um, this is from FluServeNet. And I, I should step back and say RSV net, flu serve net, and what we call COVID net is it's it's all a hospital-based um, surveillance system that that is housed under the umbrella term REST net, and and it's comprised of EIP sites of which California has one, uh, I think housed in northern in the Bay Area, uh, as well as some other um, hospitals that came on board for influenza surveillance in the past. So these these um, these all actually have an interactive uh, interface online where you can play with the different rates and uh, look at different subgroups. So again, this is flu serve net. This is showing um, a bunch of prior flu seasons in different colors, and then the red line showing the early season. Uh, and we're still early, and these are still pretty low uh, population-based rates, but, but you can see that uh, it's, it's rising um, extremely earlier than usual um, much earlier than we would normally see. And we don't know what that means for how high the rates will go or how long it will persist. Um, uh, so far, most of the flu, detection, flu viruses that are being detected are influenza A, H3N2 viruses. Uh, and interestingly, right now, about 30% of the flu hospitalizations in this surveillance system are from pediatric patients. So a third are from peds patients, which is higher than has been seen in the last four seasons. And uh, wouldn't be a talk without at least one COVID slide. So this is COVID net pediatric hospitalization rates, um, and it's and it's just showing it by age group. And the and the top golden line is the zero to six six months, which has consistently had the highest rates, but really became obvious uh, with the Omicron surge in early uh, end of the year 2021, early 2022. So you see that gigantic peak with Omicron. Uh, and then you also see in, in kind of the late summer this year that we, we were again seeing COVID in the infants zero to six months. Um, and I think just to kind of put this in context, you can see the rates here are about 20 per 100,000 population for COVID. Uh, whereas for RSV that I showed you a little ways back, that recent rate for RSV is 150 per 100,000. Um, uh, and flu is about 2.5 2 per 100,000. So just to give you a sense, right now, 
RSV is definitely what's driving the hospitalizations, but we are seeing an early rise in flu, and we may we may be seeing um, some increasing activity in the infants with COVID, but it's still a little too early to say. Um, and then this is, uh, again, looking at data from the new vaccine surveillance network, and this is test positivity for uh, all of the viruses over the course of this year, so from January to November. You know, it's quite a lot of colors, um, but the things I want you to notice, the, the gray bars in the background are actually showing the, the number of children with acute respiratory illness. So those continue to increase week by week. And then the specimens positive for RSV and the red line are, are going off the chart and uh, have been increasing since September. Um, one thing that I haven't mentioned yet in this talk is the orange line. That's the line for the rhinovirus enterovirus, which has been has been elevated all year, um, unusually so actually. So uh, if you remember back in um, early September, there was a Han, a health alert network notice that went out that was all about severe respiratory illness associated with rhinoviruses and enteroviruses. And it also pointed out that this included EVD68. So it put out a call for watching for acute flaccid myelitis cases and being aware that that might um, happen uh, which I don't think came like we thought it would, but the rhino entero positivity has, has really not gone away. Um, and so I think there, there has been a trend towards a lot more older children hospitalized with RSV this year compared to previous years. And one thought is that might be in part because of rhino entero co-circulating and actually contributing to different uh, exacerbations of asthma and wheezing in these older children. Um, we are seeing a lot more viral co-detections in these hospitalization systems this year compared to previous seasons, but most of those are RSV with rhino, rhino intro. Um, and, and even accounting for all these co-detections, so far with RSV hospitalizations, we aren't seeing increased severity of disease, um, just increased rates. And so when, when they've looked at length of hospital stay or the proportion being admitted to the ICU or getting mechanical ventilation, so far those um, are actually similar to previous RSV seasons despite the huge surge. So I guess just to kind of summarize, we are continuing to see a national increase in pediatric respiratory illness uh, and are really at what would normally be peak winter levels. Um, as typically seen throughout the year, children less than age five, and especially those less than six months, have the highest RSV-associated hospitalization rates. Um, but compared to previous years, there are more RSV ED visits and hospitalizations among older children as well. Um, I mentioned that some of the regions, the, the three, four, six, and nine HHS regions actually do seem to maybe have hit their peak uh, and, and are decreasing. Um, the uh, early increases in seasonal influenza are starting to be seen so far with the highest levels of activity in the south central and southeast regions of the country. Um, and, and I mentioned that the viral co-infections are, are more frequent than previous years, uh, in large part because of this high rhinovi rhinovirus enterovirus circulation. Um, so important things that we can do right now are encourage vaccines uh, for flu and COVID. And um, there, there is messaging both in the, in the health advisory that went out and on the website from CDC uh, advising that particularly for hospitalized patients, it's important uh, that, that diagnostics are used to determine the etiology because we do have therapy for some of these viruses, and uh, it, 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 particularly in hospitalized patients, it's good to know what they have. And, and if testing is going to be done, molecular testing is recommended. Actually, I think I'll, I think I'll wear my flu hat just very briefly for a minute and, and, and emphasize that, um, because we are starting to see flu uh, increase, uh, and antivirals are recommended for all hospitalized patients, regardless of timing, as well as for high-risk outpatients and patients with progressive illness. So 
that would be the other group to think about diagnostics in are outpatients that are um, high risk. Anyway, we can talk more about that, but um, I keep thinking of all these messages I wanna tell you as we're going through. So, okay, prevention. I am moving to, um, to talking about actual uh, uh, interventions, vaccinations and immunoprophylaxis, but um, I, I have to, I have to say that one of my favorite studies about RSV um, is about its transmission. And, and I was taught this when I was a fellow um, by my mentor. And I, I think it's important to think about. Um, I don't know how many of you know the study from 1981 by Carolyn Hall, um, where she looked at the modes of transmission of RSV. She was really trying to investigate aerosol versus droplet versus fomites and self-inoculation from the fomites. And so she had uh, three groups of adults uh, participate in a study in the hospital, and there were sitters, touchers, and cuddlers. Um, and the sitters were these mostly students, as I understand it, um, who uh, who agreed to do the study. They came. They sat in the room more than more than six weeks away from the. I'm sorry, more than six feet away from the infected baby, uh, and they just sat. Uh, touchers came into the room when the baby wasn't even there and touched the area around the crib, and then they had to gently rub the mucous membranes of their nose or their eye. And the cuddlers held the baby, changed the baby, played with the babies. Nobody wore masks. The sitters wore gloves. Uh, and the results were that the sitters didn't get infected at all. You can sit more than six feet from a baby with RSV and not get infected. The cuddlers did, about 70%. And the touchers, 40%. And so this study really drove home the importance of direct contact with secretions, but especially of fomites and, and the risk of auto inoculation. And they also swabbed the surfaces and were able to culture virus from the room when the baby was no longer in it. And so I think I, I, I tell this story to say that basic prevention and infection prevention measures are critical. Um, I can't emphasize hand hygiene enough and avoiding touching the mouth and the nose and just all those practical things. But I know this is, this is difficult, um, but I just kind of wanted to, to emphasize that and then say that there are hopefully other modes of prevention on the horizon, um, and I'll move to telling you about those now. But I love the cuddler sitter toucher paper, and I think it, um, if, if any of you have looked at you know, infection prevention guidance before COVID came, that's why RSV is contact uh, because of that self-inoculation risk. So before we talk about the actual vaccines uh, and monoclonals, I just wanted to show you the, the virion structure of RSV. Uh, so it has uh, surface pro proteins called uh, F and G. G is the attachment protein and F is the fusion, fusion protein. And these are the targets of neutralizing antibodies and the most potent antibodies are directed against F. So all of the RSV trial vaccine products are, are either targeted toward F alone or a combination of RSV antigens that includes F. There is a little sequence variability in um, circulating viruses with F that could affect the, the efficacy, um, but, but not too much. Uh, the monoclonals are also directed against F. Oops, oh, I'm gonna go too far. Okay, um, so this is this beautiful picture from uh, a review article by Barney Graham that shows how the F protein actually exists in two uh, major structural forms uh, and they, they have different binding capacity. So the, the one on the left is this demi-stable or metastable, I've heard it described. That's the pre-fusion F. Um, and then the right is the more stable post-fusion F and that's what it looks like after it fuses with the target cell and totally has a structural rearrangement and exposes different regions. Uh, and what, what's fascinating about the decades long research into RSV is that the vaccines used to try to target the post-fusion F until they figured out a way to stabilize the pre-fusion F. And that has really changed everything. And there are now products um, in the market uh, that, that are pretty far along vaccination against RSV. So there are a number of vaccine products in preclinical and clinical trials. They can be categorized into kind of five groups. Um, 
actually, I think I said a number of vaccine products. The first four are vaccine and the last one are monoclonals. So the different vaccines include live attenuated, protein-based, nucleic acid-based, like, like the mRNA vaccines used for COVID and recombinant vectors. And then the immunoprophylaxis approach is the monoclonal. Um, and, and I think this is probably the one that you all know about. This is the one uh, product we have right now, which is a monoclonal, Talavizumab or Synergis is the trade name. It's the only current RSV prevention product that's licensed in the US. Uh, it is a humanized monoclonal antibody. It targets um, the, the site two on the F protein that I showed. Um, it has a really short half-life. So you all know it has to be given every month. Um, the initial trials of palavizumab demonstrated 55% efficacy uh, in preventing RSV-associated hospitalization in preterm infants and infants with chronic lung disease, and about a 45% efficacy for infants with congenital heart disease. So right now, um, there, is a, there is AAP guidance on this that recommends use in infants less than 29 weeks gestation during the first year of life, preterm infants with chronic lung disease, infants with hemodynamically significant congenital heart disease, profound immunocompromised, and, and these recommendations mean that approximately 5% of U.S. infants are eligible, and the data suggests that only about 2% of the annual birth cohort um, receive uh, synergists. Oh, and I should note, um, actually, that uh, the AAP has put out, I think it was starting as early as August this year, they have put out interim guidance for the use of synergists, given this um, unusual uh, uh, seasonality of RSV this year. So typically, you know, it, it waits until the winter uh, surge starts, but now there's guidance uh, that it should be used wherever activity is, um, has, uh, wherever RSV activity is unusually high. Um, this is a slide that uh, can be found on the PATH website. Uh, they always have these nice slides that show all the products in development for different viruses. Um, I think what's, what's probably most exciting is that there are actually some products over in the phase three uh, uh, section, and, and it's been a long time for that uh, to be the case. So the one that I wanna mention um, is the phase three Pfizer RSV F protein vaccine. Um, some of you have, have, may have seen that on November 1st, so just two weeks ago, there was a press release from Pfizer about their vaccine. Uh, and this, this was from their Matisse study, which stood for Maternal Immunization Study for Safety and Efficacy. Uh, and it's using this, this RSV prefusion candidate uh, they gave it to pregnant participants to protect their infants from RSV disease after birth. And they reported a vaccine efficacy of 81.8% against severe medically attended lower respiratory tract illness due to RSV in infants from birth through the first 90 days of life. And then um, an efficacy of 69.4% through the first six months of life. Uh, and they reported that it was well tolerated with no safety concerns. So, um, what does that mean for when we might be able to use it? Um, they, they do have to submit uh, um, to the FDA a biologic license application. And, and I think as far as anyone knows, that hasn't been done yet. And then the typical timeline for FDA to, to do fast track or priority review of a BLA is about eight months. Uh, and so I think from publicly available information, most of us feel like we, we wouldn't it, it would be hard to get the maternal vaccine on the docket for the June ACIP meeting next year for a vote. That seems almost too soon. It seems more likely that it might be October, which if you imagine the vaccine for pregnant women being approved in October, it would take a while um, for, depending on the RSV seasonality, hopefully we would see that in use in the next season, but, but, but we don't know. I think the, the product that people are a little more optimistic might come first uh, is this newer monoclonal um, called Nersevimab. So this is a picture again of the, the prefusion F. Uh, and like I said, the Talavizumab synergist product uh, um, targets site two, which is the yellow one, and Nersevimab targets site zero. And I should have mentioned that the potency of binding is, is indicated there by the picture. So site zero actually is a very potent binding 
epitope. Um, and the, the, the great thing about nirsevimab is it's long acting. It doesn't need to be given every month. So nirsevimab had, had its pivotal phase three trial results come out earlier this year called the Melody study. Um, and they also, in that trial, they had an efficacy of 74.5%. So basically 75% versus the incidence of RSV confirmed medically attended lower respiratory tract infection in infants that were born uh, at 35 weeks gestation or after, and that lasted 150 days after dosing. So they're, they're pushing for this to be used in all infants, um, and, it, and it would be one injection that would prevent through the season. They also did a, a, a pooled analysis of their phase three and phase two B data, and it had an efficacy of almost 80%, 79.5% against the medically attended lower respiratory tract infections, which included hospitalizations from RSV. Um, so this has been pretty exciting. And actually one of the questions I know that was submitted was what about this um, product that was approved in, in Europe? So this, this is it. There was a press release on November 4th and the European Commission actually granted the first worldwide approval of nirsevimab to prevent RSV disease in infants. And it's, it's really the first, so it's the first regulatory body ever um, that has given approval to this. The trade name is Bayfortis or something, but I, I don't know it as that. I, I just know it as nirsevimab. Um, so Europe has, has now approved this. Um, and, and ACIP has, has already been discussing it um, and, that, and this is one of the other resources I want to add to your resource list. Um, the ACIP meeting in June of this year actually had um, quite a bit of information on RSV presented, and those slides are a lot of what I've shown you today, and those are um, publicly available on the, on the ACIP website. So I'll, I'll include that link when I give it to you. Uh, but the ACIP working group is, is really pondering two main questions. So should nirsevimab be recommended for all infants less than eight months of age entering their first RSV season, uh, as, well, as well as all infants born during the season? And then the second question is, should it be recommended for children less than 24 months of age who are entering their second RSV season who are at risk of severe disease? Uh, and they've so far reviewed the, the phase two and phase three studies uh, the plan is to review the additional evidence um, up to the 24 month of age endpoint. Uh, and so in February, the, the projected timeline on, on the website for ACIP is to discuss the grade analysis, the cost effectiveness analysis, and the, um, the evidence to recommendations in the February meeting. And at least right now, if this product gets li licensed by FDA in time, to vote on it in June of 2023, which would mean that it could be available uh, as early as, as next winter RSV season. But again, that is dependent on, um, on the company submitting their, uh, their biologic application, their BLA application to FDA. And I'm not actually sure if that's happened yet. Um, I'm not sure we know, but it, it, I don't think it had. So hopefully that will, that will come true. Um, so, so in conclusion with this part of the talk, uh, pre-pandemic RSV seasonality was well-defined um, and really not a lot of variability, but COVID-19 has disrupted that. Um, RSV is uh, the most common cause of hospitalization in U.S. infants, um, and the highest risk is in the first months of life, and it, in, it declines with increasing age. Um, as I mentioned, prematurity and other chronic conditions can increase the risk of hospitalization, but, but truly most of these uh, babies are healthy term infants. Uh, the currently licensed product, um, palivizumab, targets only about 5% of U.S. infants. And these new prevention candidates uh, in late stages of development, including nirsevimab, would target potentially all infants in their first season. Um, so I think that's, that's the, the formal part of the talk. These are the resources that I, I have supplied with actual links. I think I'll add a couple more that I mentioned. Um, and uh, I think we're ready for the discussion. I should thank all these people who um, contributed to the content of this, uh, of this presentation. So thanks. Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot to advance the slide. There we go. Great. Wonderful. Thank you so much. That was a lot of information. Um, 
Yeah, we, um, so I noticed that the region that includes California and your map looked like it was in the middle of the pack in terms of um, incidence rates, um, but yet our hospitals seem very full. Um, Orange County um, in Southern California has actually declared an emergency due to RSV. And I heard today from one of their um, docs that they even converted playrooms into inpatient rooms. Um, so, uh, but I'll just start with a simple uh, question from the um, question and answer. Can you share the infection and hospitalization rates by race and ethnicity? Yeah, I, that's such an excellent question. And I saw that was asked and that is why I thought it would be um, fun to show you this. Okay, so, so can you see my screen? Uh, no. I think you might have to oh, because I, I forgot to push share. Yeah. Okay. okay, so now you see this. So this is the this is the um, interactive RSV net dashboard, and um, a small, but uh, but but what they are seeing to answer this this question rather quickly is um, well, first I first I want to say that in the past. The, the, the racial ethnic um, groups that have had the highest rates of RSV, I think many people have seen these publications, have been the um, American Indian Alaska Native infants, um, particularly the uh, Alaska Natives and the Navajo and White Mountain Apaches. There have been papers written about that. However, um, it, it's such a good question because I took a look at this, um, this data. I want to limit to children. And one thing, if you play with the race ethnicity buttons here, if you just look at the white non-Hispanics, it's quite high. The black non-Hispanic, everybody should be watching this little green line, kind of low. It really looks to me like the Hispanic is what's driving the highest hospitalization rates right now. And that is that is what the, the, the manager who oversees RSVNet told me as well. Um, they're, they're seeing, uh, high uh, proportion of Hispanics and in some areas um, um, of black children uh, right now with RSV. And I think to your point about the hospitalization or the hospitals overflowing, I, I also saw an article in, about LA setting up tents outside and I, you know, the, the surveillance data lag a bit. And so you're probably seeing what we'll see in a couple of weeks on the figures, unfortunately. So do we know why this is happening? Uh, RSV being super early, we're seeing way more severe disease. In my office, I'm seeing five and 10 year olds who are wheezing with RSV and not just the little babies are getting hospitalized. I know on social media, there's a lot of conspiracy theories and a lot of, uh, a, a lot of people chiming in on what they think is going on, but what do, you, what do you think is happening? Why do you think this is so, so severe this year? Yeah, I, I don't think we know for certain. I think I think there are some thoughts. I, one of one of them is what I mentioned earlier that that this high um, circulation of of rhinovirus enterovirus is is not something we typically test for, but a lot of um, a lot of those viruses uh, have have prolonged shedding and contribute to wheezing in these older children. So some of what we might be seeing is a is co-detection, de, co co-infection, but you're not detecting both of them because we don't test for the rhinoentero in outpatients typically. Um, I, I guess the, the other piece that, that seems to make sense is that these older children may have actually made it through the pandemic and, and the early pandemic phase and not gotten their infant RSV infection. Uh, you know, if they were born during the pandemic or just before they didn't they didn't get RSV in the first year of life or even in the second year of life like like the, the typical uh, uh, teaching says they would have and so they may be actually seeing their primary infection in, as older toddlers uh, and uh, that could be a part of it as well. Um, along the same lines you know we previously always thought that the larger airways and the older child would prevent them from getting severe infection. So if the preventative strategies on the horizon include a maternal vaccine and a monoclonal antibody that's given to infants in their first year of life, would we just be delaying their infection to their second or third year of life? 
Well, you know, I will admit that I don't know the details of the trials well enough, but I would want to look and see if they, they may have well still had infection, but the outcomes of these trials are, are medically attended LRTI or, you know, very severe lower respiratory tract infections. So um, ideally, it's preventing severe illness, but they're still getting their exposure uh, to RSV, and that would still be somewhat protective. I mean, I, I didn't I didn't say this, but we do know, unfortunately, that it that that immunity is not durable for a lifetime, and that we tend to get RSV even as adults. But it's not really until someone with an underlying condition or uh, adult 65 or older gets it that it tends to cause severe illness. But we are we have learned a lot in in the last not recent but several years that adults 65 and over have a high burden of RSV as well. So yeah, I've thought about that a little bit, but I I think. I think the highest, highest, most vulnerable population are those less than six months, six months. So if we can protect them, then hopefully we would get back to sort of just a normal uh, upper respiratory illness when they see it again. So when, when COVID got really bad, we started to approve vaccines based on emergency use authorizations. And we had some people write in and wonder, like, are we at the point where we need some of these vaccines and monoclonal products to be pushed through a little bit faster than the normal regulatory uh, mechanisms? Or uh, can we wait? Yeah, that's a that's an interesting question. I have asked several people and no one seems to think that it will be the same as COVID um, uh, again for these types of products. But I, I don't know. I don't have a I don't have 100% certainty of that, but um, uh, there's certainly still data to be reviewed and uh, and and submission to the FDA, as far as I know, has to happen still. So I don't know. It's a good question. I I've wondered it, but I I don't I I have been um, advised not to not to be hopeful. <laughs> uh, I mean, I don't mean to sound negative, but. But but not to think that that, that what happened with COVID would happen uh, with these RSV products that that it's probably going to be the typical timeline. Um, we have a question about pelivizumab and you know if a, a, an eligible infant actually had co um, that COVID RSV this season because it's such a unusual season and potentially prolonged, um, should they receive more doses? Uh, for the rest of the season. Yeah, I I don't know. I I don't feel uh, qualified or comfortable to answer that yet because I don't think we know what's going to happen. Um, I I think if you look at that peak in 2021, it was it was totally out of the usual season, but it didn't last longer than we typically see. It was just intraseasonal. So. Maybe that will happen again. I, I think we are all starting to feel a little bit hopeful that the early regions are now showing a, a bit of a decline. And so it, I don't think we know yet whether the season is going to be longer than typical. It may just be at an atypical time. Uh, and I think we'd have to, we'd have to, I mean, obviously that would be uh, something that we would we would work with AAP on uh, so I just can't I can't really say for certain right now. I have some uh, some primary care pediatrician questions for you. So just basic RSV facts. So what's the approximate incubation period that we expect from RSV? And um, you know we see these kids tend to be kind of snotty for like two weeks. At, at what point do you, do you think? it's safe to send them back to school or to be around their younger siblings uh, and not put everybody at risk. Yeah, I, I have seen that one um, come in ahead of time and, and uh, to be honest, decided that's probably one I can't address. Uh, it reminds me of the, the questions that I used to get when I was in the flu division. Uh, and what we've really learned is that schools and daycares and churches are, are all going to have their own guidance, and it can actually vary quite a bit. Uh, in fact, I even took a look at some of the different websites and, and um, different states. <laughs> so many so many factors play into that, um, that uh, what I say may not be the case for a given school or a given daycare. 
Um, but typically it's not, there's, there's, there's nothing so stringent as like the COVID isolation guidance, um, typically for respiratory illnesses. And typically uh, schools and, and childcare settings will let kids come back if they're 24 to 48 hours afebrile and, and can control secretion. So I think practically speaking that RSV has not changed and it's, it's um, you know, uh, probably something like that is, is uh, what has been in place and what will continue to be in place. I don't necessarily think that we can change the guidance uh, and keep these kids out because it's, it's it's not only at the school that they're getting it. It's from their siblings. It's it's the secretions that are everywhere, and and that wouldn't really behoove children well to to have long um, uh, long. I can't think of any word except for a ban uh, a time out of school. Um, let's see incubation period. I I'm afraid I. I don't want to misspeak on this. Um, so COVID, you know, early COVID, we, send, we tended to say two to five days. Flu, we say one to two days. RSV, I think, is on the order of like one to four days. But I honestly um, would need to look. I can't, I can't tell you if that's for sure right now. Um, the, typically, like flu, we say that kids are probably contagious a day or so before they start having symptoms. Um, and then, like you already said, I mean, if, if it does develop to uh, the classic thing we say in the hospital, I do some patient care as well, is that until they're like past day four or five, we're probably not out of the woods for lower tract illness being at its worst. Uh, but then, like you said, there can be ongoing symptoms for two weeks and uh, or even longer just from the persistent cough. Uh, and I definitely wouldn't recommend that kids have to be asymptomatic to return to school or daycare. Um, thank you, Red Book, that is what we need. Uh, incubation period, so it's actually quite long. Yeah, that's what, I was, um, that's what I was struggling with, so I appreciate that. When in doubt, and I have mine right here, go to the Red Book. <laughs> I'm not even showing it very well. <laughs> Great. Um, can you briefly comment on RSV in adults and uh, also in immunocompromised hosts that are older, out of infancy? Yeah. Um, I think I didn't even talk about that, but it is quite exciting that there are a couple of adult vaccines in the pike um, uh, in phase three as well. And and I think there there has been more and more documentation of severe illness. And when they actually test hospitalized adults with with um, respiratory tract illness, RSV is a, a pretty common cause. So I think that recognition is increasing that it, it can be a cause of very severe illness, particularly in those over 65 or with high risk conditions. The truly immunocompromised population is, um, is, is, is kind of unique on its own, right? Whether you're an adult, a, a teen or a, a child, um, RSV is extremely uh, severe. That's actually that's actually the beginning of my career was looking at um, RSV in uh, hematopoietic stem cell transplant patients, and and that is um, that is the one population where uh, sometimes uh, novel antivirals or <laughs> different treatment modalities are tried that wouldn't be otherwise. Well, we have run out of time. Uh, Dr. Campbell, thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. Um, we are so excited about the prospect of having some sort of tools in our arsenal to combat RSV in the near future. And I hope people will remember this talk and remember those slides when parents are having conversations about whether it's worth getting their kids or their pregnant colleagues uh, vaccinated against RSV. So I hope we all remember how bad this disease truly is. And hopefully we won't have to talk about it in the future like we do now. Um, so, you know, as part of the California Immunization Coalition, we always want to end by just reminding people that vaccination is the most effective way to prevent influenza, COVID-19, hopefully RSV in the near future. And a lot of our big crush that we're seeing in our emergency departments and our pediatric offices are due to people who are coming in not only for RSV, but for those vaccine preventable diseases. So it's making it much harder 
for people who actually need care to get in because there are kids who are there with the flu or COVID that might not need to be there if they had been vaccinated. Um, Please stay tuned. We plan to continue these conversations um, as needed as things come up, and especially as new innovations come out with RSV vaccines. We promise we will be back with more talks about that. And then we will send out everyone a, um, a survey, and we appreciate if you fill it out because it really helps us to figure out new topics to do in the future. Again, these talks are all uh, archived and are recorded and on our YouTube channel, as well as on the um, California Immunization Coalition website. And with that, um, thank you so much to Dr. Campbell, Dr. Panaraj, to Catherine and Cameron from CIC, who always put this together on such quick notice. And thanks everyone for joining us uh, today. Uh, thanks for all you do to keep the kids of California and everywhere else uh, safe and healthy. So have a great night, y'all.